question today to have Professor Renee James visiting us from State Houston, sorry, Sam Houston State University, just up the road. She finished her PhD in astronomy from UT Austin before moving to Sam Houston State in 1999. Sorry, the faculty from there. Uh, she has write, written extensively both about astronomy and science, publishing in Astronomy and Sky and Telescope magazines, ones that I read very frequently. You um, got a popular science writing award from the AAAS. And and is this true? A gold star award from NASA. A gold NASA. star. A gold I star award from NASA. I thought that is, you know, <laughs> got to be one of the high points. But um, she's been writing uh, very frequently for non-scientists just about various topics. And today she'll be telling us about her recent book, Science Unshackled: How Obscured, Abstract, Seemingly Useless Scientific Research. I try not to take offense at that. It turned out to be the basis for modern life. Okay, I, I do want to mention actually, I did not have anything to do with the titling of this book. When, when you're not Neil deGrasse Tyson, you get told what your book title is. Is that true? It, it is. Uh, I mean, I had, a, I had a title. That was it. Uh, <laughs> I, I thought that would have sold a lot better, honestly. But they, they, well, they kind of balled with that. Um, but it... it I like the yeah. There's the there's the rat. There's the rat. Oh god. So you were the one who got started on the uh, you know Birdman or the yeah the, the subtitle of the of Birdman you know yeah yeah uh, I, <coughs> so, something or other of ignorance yes the the unexpected something of ignorance yeah. okay um. <coughs> now the the book itself has has five main parts and. What I originally had the idea for it, it was mostly, actually it was purely an astronomical sort of thing. Uh, and then they said, well, can we make this more a celebration of science? And I said, okay, well, that's fine. And so now there's two parts in here that are, that there's uh, biological um, pieces in there. The funny thing is when I was talking to chemists, you know, I tried to get it as far afield as I could. And so I, I surveyed a number of people, you know, what sort of things have happened in your field that you know, would fit the theme of this book that I'm trying to write, and the chemists could never come up with anything. They never gave me anything, but I had, you know, biologists and geologists uh, all giving me suggestions for things that could be incorporated, and then I wound up sort of narrowing it down to, to some that I thought told a pretty good narrative. But where this idea came from was almost five years ago. Okay, this was this was the summer from hell for me, and if, on July 6th of 2011, just kind of out of the blue, we get this word, hey, James Webb Space Telescope funding will not be happening anymore. And, you know, the entire astronaut community just exploded, I think, on that day. And, you know, and then they're like, I'm just kidding, never mind, <laughs> right? But, you know, that happened. At the exact same time, the Kepler mission was kind of scrambling. Okay, this was only two, two years after their launch, and they had had enough funding to go three. And so what they really wanted was to get some extra funding to keep scrambling along past September 2012. These guys, are, of the successful NASA missions, this one's like at the top, I would say, uh, or at least really darn close to the top, because it's done everything that they set out to do, and it has done it really, really well. And even when it breaks, it's not broken. All right, so you know we've, we've got a, a Kepler that's kind of limping along still, but it, it's still putting out some amazing science. And so they were begging for money, and that was sort of uncertain in its future. And then, you know, these days, it's gotten to the point where it's like, tell us about an interesting planet. I don't know if you saw the little comment. Uh, it was out, it's the Onion article. You know, <laughs> Kepler to find, or NASA scientists find a, a new planet that makes Earth look like, yeah. Um, and that's kind of what they're getting down to now. You know, it's not enough to say, hey, we found a new planet. It's like, oh, we found a new planetary system. Oh, we found a new planetary system that has three things in the habitable zone. You know, so their, their bar is getting higher and higher. So. You know, I would say that Kepler's right up there, but back in, in that summer, it was still kind of, I'm not sure if we're even going to get this pocket change, cosmically speaking, to keep going. And then there was the last shuttle launch, the exact same week that the James Webb Space Telescope announcement came out. And I had been telling myself since the first shuttle launch that I was going to get out and see the shuttle launch one day. I was going to make it out to Florida, and I was going to watch this happen because 
I've never seen a launch of anything. And so 30 years of saying, I'm going to go see a launch, and I never, ever, ever did. And so it was, uh, it was a teaching a summer session. I took my students into the little planetarium that we've got and had it projected up on the, the dome, um, which, by the way, is not the best way to watch a launch of something, you know, because the, the perspective is really weird. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as it launches, I'm thinking, holy crap, it's going the wrong way. Oh my gosh, this is the last one, and it's going to like crash. Mm -hmm. No, it's just dumb. Anyway, so here's the last shuttle launch. I literally was in tears because I'd never, ever seen it happen. Okay, this isn't necessarily an astronomical problem, it's just this was a, this was a life thing that, that I've been looking forward to. And, you know, this whole week, the, the, the future of so much is uncertain. I happened to be reading an article on CNN.com or something, and for whatever stupid reason, read the comments under the article, which is a bad practice, and it's frustrating, <coughs> but I saw that. Plan on doing it there anyway. Can they cure cancer? Asinine comments cure cancer. And I thought about this. <laughs> and decide what, what should be done. You know, find the person, punch them out. That's a good possibility. <laughs> Neither does Justin Bieber, but we're okay throwing millions of dollars at him. <coughs> or you never know, they just might. They, they might. Um, Justin's going for two. <laughs> yeah. That may be the first time Justin Bieber has shown up <laughs> in the building. I was excited, actually, that the Academy Awards had a nod to a, a you know, a black hole theory. And so. so I figure I can bring up Justin Bieber. <laughs> okay. It's weird because our, our, our generation of, of scientists, for some reason, sort of feels uniquely persecuted. Like, nobody has ever questioned what they do before, until now. But this is something that scientists have been wrestling with forever. And if you, you know, the, the Kepler had a very eloquent response, basically, to the, why are you wasting your brain power trying to figure out how the planets are moving? And says this in German, but you know, we, we do not ask for what useful purpose the birds do sing. Lady Gaga has an answer to this. It's, we're born this way, right? We're curious about stuff. We have this drive to understand what's going on with the universe. Um, Kepler said it a lot more eloquently, but I don't think it's reached as many people. Michael Faraday. Okay. Arguably, really, really important scientist in history, right? In the history of science, we've got this guy who was giving a speech one time, uh, giving a, a, a presentation, and says, before leaving the substance chlorine, I will point out its history as an answer to those <coughs> who are in the habit of saying to every new fact, what's its use? Okay. He is wrestling with this every single time he presents something new to people. You know, we're talking at the time these people were still working on creating the periodic chart <coughs> and the properties of elements. And that, again, you know, we think well, that's that seems pretty fundamental and pretty useful to understand how the elements behave. Um, and you know, he's he's giving this this talk about chlorine. I, I can't imagine life without chlorine. It's a wonderful germ killer, right? You know, you put it in your pool and stuff, but. Back then, it was just kind of a curiosity. Uh, Dr. Ben Franklin said, what's the use of an infant? <laughs> had some friends over last night, and one of them's got a little baby newborn. It's like four weeks old. Never once occurred to me, <laughs> why do you have that thing? What's it good for? <laughs> it just sits around and eats a lot. Seriously. J.J. Uh, Thompson had a, a really awesome response. To the electron, may it never be of any use to anybody. Okay, he literally would toast this. Okay, and he he didn't he just didn't give a rat's ass, really, is what it boiled down to. Okay. If you missed the very beginning, this book uh, used to be called that. They wouldn't let me call it that. That's sad. Where do you put shrimp on the bed? 
Say what? Do we really put trim on treadmills? Yes, we really put trim on treadmills. And if you go to YouTube, you can, uh, you can see them to the William Tell Overture running. <laughs> <laughs> not making this up. I could not make this up. All right. So what we get out of things like that, um, you know, to the electron, may it never be of any use to anybody, is that scientists really suck at predicting the ultimate usefulness of what they're doing. They really just don't know. If they knew what they were doing, they wouldn't call it research, right? I mean, we're just trying to find things out. And so if you say stuff like, you know, I hope the electron is never useful, you know, what, would he be bummed that this is the way it's turned out? That now that we understand the properties of this thing, we can exploit it and, and it's practically running our lives now? Or would he go, oh, hey, that's awesome. Don't really know. Another thing, uh, and this is something that's, that's creeping back in, into our culture these days is when you're Michael Faraday in 1816 and you're trying to discuss the properties of this, this element chlorine, most people just kind of glaze over and go, wow, properties of the element chlorine, the like of that's ever going to help me. Um, and these days we get paper titles that are even less comprehensible to anybody. But you can't judge the ultimate worth by the title of the paper or the title of the research grant. Okay? You, you can't, you just can't do that. They're not written for the average human. They're written for your colleagues, you know, that, that actually understand what the words are that you've put in there. Okay? Unfortunately, we've got people that are very adept at judging scholarship by the title of the thing. Back in the 80s, we had the Golden Fleece Awards, which basically was uh, Senator William Proxmire decided, hmm, we're wasting money. We should maybe find things that are being paid for on the taxpayer dime that don't look like they're necessarily doing anything good. And so he started to, to hand out these Golden Fleece Awards. These are the things that are fleecing America. Okay, they're, we're pulling the wool over the taxpayers' eyes and using their money for something stupid. And one of those something stupids was the, the sex life of the screw worm, which turns out to be a rather nasty livestock parasite. And so the title of the thing got this guy's attention. He thought, wow, that's creepy, bug voyeurism. <laughs> But it turns out that you know it was a relatively modest grant. I think it was uh, like maybe two hundred thousand dollars back in the in the eighties. But it was fundamental to fixing a problem in a multi-billion-dollar you know, cattle industry, because this parasite would kill these cows very, very slowly and nastily, okay? and, and it was an agonizing sort of, of, of end for them. Eventually, Proxmire said. Okay, maybe looking at just the titles of papers isn't such a great idea. But now we got our own guy doing that. You know, poking around in the National Science <coughs> Foundation grant proposals and picking things out by their titles, picking things out by their abstracts <coughs> to decide, not as a scientist, but as a politician, this is not something that should be funded. I don't care what the grant panel said. We say this isn't something that we should be giving money to, and he says that the efforts of, of his little committee are going to continue until the NSF agrees to only award grants that are in the national interest, which is kind of interesting for people that don't have the training in the fields that these grants are going to. So, you know, I, I could pick apart the grammar of this sentence, which you really mean is to award only grants, or to award grants that um, you split your infinitive and put your only in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. Right. And you wonder why are these people so fixated on this stuff? And what it really boils down to is, is money. Right? The, the Canadian National Research Council president, John McDougall, says scientific discovery is not valuable unless it has commercial value. That's nuts for a scientist. Right? You think that, that no. <laughs> 
You don't have to actually create a widget. That's an engineering problem. That's not a science thing. Scientific discovery is, is the creation of new knowledge. And the number of people at higher levels that are thinking this way uh, is, is becoming kind of disturbing. Now imagine that pendulum going to swing back and forth. And, but right now, culturally, in, in our country, in Canada, Australia is seeing the same thing. We're, we're kind of sliding to the, I don't understand the title of your paper, I don't know what it is that you're doing, but I'm pretty sure that you're wasting our money and we really need to be working on more important things that are staring us right in the face. Okay, it's not, you know, some super massive black hole. <coughs> but when you look at the actual money, you know, the, the, the real live amount, like you could say, National Science Foundation is looking at this half million dollar grant that these people want, and you go, whoa, half a million dollars. Your average person goes, my gosh, that's a great amount of money. I would love to make that. And we're wasting it giving these people this, they're gonna go make some computer simulation of something out in space. But if you just throw a raw number at somebody, you lose the perspective. So here's, here's your science budget over the course of 40 years or so. This is basically your, your pure research stuff. It's hanging out of the general $70 billion range uh, for the United States. NASA and all of the United States astronomy efforts are somewhere a little under $20 billion, give or take. The entire U.S. budget is about 20 screens tall, give or take. The 2012 London Olympics, hanging out, 14 billion. The 2012 London Olympics, it was like a singular event. That was it. And, and people went, well, you know, that's the price of bringing the Olympics to our country. Like, that's one event, really, for a bunch of athletes to come and hang out there for three weeks. And I know there was a whole lot of building and infrastructure and stuff that had to be dealt with. But when you compare that to, this is NASA's budget, you know, NASA's entire annual budget is on the same order of magnitude as the Olympics of 2012. And that's something that I think people don't really quite grasp, is you know, if you just tell them a number, they go, dang, that's a big number. But if you go, you know what, it's about the amount that it takes to put Olympics together. And they go, oh wait, that, that's not so bad. Or maybe we just shouldn't bother with Olympics anymore. Don't know. <laughs> so anyway, um, there are a number of, of things that, with people looking at just titles, they may have plucked them out and said, this isn't necessarily worth funding. Here's one of the ones that's probably one of the more famous ones. It's the limits on cosmic radio bursts with microsecond timescales. Right? 1978, might as well have just not done that work because it really couldn't have been too much of a, of a big deal. Uh, and John O'Sullivan, Ron Akers, and Peter Shaver collaborating on this. There's John O'Sullivan there. Okay. And what it boils down to is, back in the early 70s, there was the idea that back in the nascent universe, that you would have these, these primordial black holes that kind of popped into existence. Sort of like little cosmic memes. Things that, for whatever reason, you know, there was nothing different necessarily about it, but for some reason that's where stuff seemed to aggregate. Like Grumpy Cat, right? Grumpy Cat is a, is a strange little internet meme that is inexplicably popular. There's no reason for it to have just launched in popularity above all these other cute cat pictures. But it's everywhere. If I just say Grumpy Cat, nope. How many of you are like, oh, yeah, I, I, I got a visual of that? Yeah. Why? Yeah. So, you know, we got sort of an internet version of the early universe going on where it seems like there's a lot of traffic that gets funneled to these, these nothing really remarkable about them sorts of things, but, but then all of a sudden you've got yourself a, an internet black hole. Okay, you've got a place where, where there's just a, a huge amount of traffic going in. Um, at least that's sort of the way I, I try to describe these primordial black holes. It, it sort of came, package deal with the universe. Possibly teeny tiny little things, cosmically speaking. I mean, in, in physical size, teeny tiny, 
But as far as mass goes, teeny tiny. We're not talking stellar mass kinds of things. We're talking things more like the, the masses of a, a small asteroid or something, or even less than that. And so, you know, here comes this idea, possibility. Hey, there might be some little bitty black holes, low mass black holes. Stephen Hawking grabs hold of that and says, oh, hey, if we've got little bitty black holes, maybe they'll die. This is in the early 70s. Nobody was really messing with the idea of black holes evaporating. That, that didn't make any sense because if you're talking about stellar mass things, that would take freaking forever. But if you started with something that was a, a much lower mass, and you had you know, the Hawking radiation going on, and you had the things slowly evaporating, then eventually, on a time scale that the universe can appreciate, eventually these things are going to go away. And so Hawking wrestles with this for a little while and says, hey, cool, on, on time scales of you know, our, our universe's age, we might have these things disappearing. Okay, they, they, they lose mass, which makes them less massive, which makes it easier for them to lose mass, which makes them less massive, which makes it easier for them to lose mass. And so it's sort of like a, a snowballing effect, or a reverse snowballing effect. And then they go out, and, there's, and then evaporation is the weirdest name ever for something like this, because it's like a monstrous catastrophe there at the end. In no time flat, you just release a crazy amount of energy. Okay? So, Mark Rees says, oh, hey, we might be able to detect that kind of thing. If there's a, if there's a primordial, teeny tiny little black hole that's evaporating, this should give off a particular signal. He does some calculations. We probably have no hope of finding it in this particular wavelength region, but we should be able to find you know, this particular signal over here in the radio wavelength region, figures out what type of signal you'd be getting from this, and he says, oh, we should go try to find these. Okay, again, we're still talking in the early <coughs> 70s. And so their basic answer is, yes, let's go find them. You know? So here, if you can sort of stay with me, what we have is the possibility that an object might exist. The possibility that if this object does exist, it might die in a certain way. And the possibility that if this object does exist and it happens to die in this certain way, we might be able to see this particular radio signal from it. So you've got something we don't know whether or not it exists, dying in a way that might or might not necessarily be true, that we could possibly pick up observationally if my calculations are right. right? And so they're like, hot dog, let's go find them. Um, this is just paraphrase. I don't know if they did that, but they, you know, that, that was sort of they, they did it sort of in between other projects that were going on, um, and tried desperately to create the instrumentation so that the radio telescope that they were using would be able to, to give them some kind of a useful signal. What they were what they were facing was the fact that you've got trillions of miles of intervening stuff that would not treat every part of that signal the same way. And so you would have to sort of reconstruct things on the, on the receiving end. And so they looked and they looked and they looked and they looked and then they wrote a paper about it, about you know using the 25 meter radio telescope and stuff in the jar. Last sentence of this, no events attributable to black holes were observed. speaking, you, you lost. You failed. You tried, you failed. Good, nice try. Come back in another time. Okay, but here's the thing. Like I said, you've got, the universe has an awful lot of stuff in it. Um, and that stuff doesn't necessarily always treat light in a way that we would like it to. Uh, and so, you know, you got your average sort of spiral galaxy here with all these big dust lanes. And, and even just the, the, the interstellar gas, uh, as the signal was coming through, would treat the high frequency part of the signal different from the low frequency part of the signal. They thought they had all of this stuff worked out so that they could reconstruct it on the receiving end. You've got background noise from you know, the whole rest of the universe. You've got a signal that's all smeared out. And so John O'Sullivan basically, after they did a number of things that were just a, you know, like kludges all piled upon each other, 
He finally goes away and says, there's got to be a better way to do this. But what we're doing is just getting ridiculous. You know, it's beginning to look like the plumbing in my house. And, well, we fixed this. And first, no, da, 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 da. It, it works, kind of. And he said, no, let's just overhaul the whole thing. Uh, and so he creates this device that reduces multipath interference with radio signals transmitted for computer networking. And you're thinking, he did what? Here's what he did. He created something that would become a fundamental component of Wi-Fi. Okay. But he did this back in the 70s, in the mid-70s, when Wi-Fi wasn't even on anybody's radar, right? Because computers were not <laughs> like this. Computers were more like in this room kind of thing. And they tried very, very, very hard to compute things that we now can do on our phones in no time flat. Um, and so, you know, when he's doing this, he's doing this to solve a problem related to astronomy. He's not doing this to solve a problem related to future communications. He's trying to solve the, I want to find some exploding black holes, because that would just be cool problem. Okay, so, here's your goal. You fail. But the thing is, when you've got something like this that you're working on and you have to, to come up with a creative solution to it, the creativity overflows into places that you don't expect. That's the thing about creativity is that it, it slides around to other things that it touches. Um, and so trying to solve that problem actually spilled over into your life in a way other than just, you know, hey, this is something that I found in a nature article one time when I was doing the background research for a thesis or something. So what we had was some funding for a curiosity-driven research project back in the 70s. It is now a fundamental part of a multi-billion dollar a year industry. Australia, which is where O'Sullivan is from and where this actually got patented, is now pulling in millions in royalties their, their Commonwealth Science and uh, CSRO, dang it, resource organization. The I is Commonwealth Science. Somebody from Australia, tell me what it is. I'll get back to you on that one. One of the things that he said, and, and by the way, the, the people on this are still alive and amazing. I sent them iterations of the section trying to understand, trying to get it down to a level that, you know, an interested high school student could read. And they would comment. And they'd say, well, no, you need to talk about the and, and they never, ever failed to respond to anything that I sent them. And they even would, you know, wax eloquent on what they thought was sort of the overarching philosophy of what was going on with their work. And one of the things that, that John O'Sullivan said that I just loved was that he likes to see our economy and activities as a sort of ecosystem. And that, I think, is something that's missing from, from the vision of a number of people, not just politicians, actually, but some you know, scientists, I think, get very focused on one little block, not realizing how it touches other things. Um, and if you cut any one of those levels back, you threaten the existence of the whole ecosystem. Not all pure research activities will lead to, lead to applied research, and many applied research efforts will lead nowhere. One of the drives in some departments that I've seen is to applied sciences. You know, what kind of a widget can you create from this? And the thing is, you that's like saying, well, your startup company better succeed, but the failure rate is huge. And I think that's one of the things that's sort of overlooked, is that you could try a hundred different things, and one of them might work. Okay, now, there's a big but on this one. There's a big yes, too. Ellipses and, and then print, uh, quotation marks too. The big but is that this is something that actually probably would have happened anyway, because the things that he used to solve the problem to to you know help figure out the, the exploding black hole signal was not magic. It was just engineering, and it was stuff that that engineers in communications were actually also working on, especially in the early 80s and the mid 80s, they realized, you know, this is dragging these cables through all of these buildings is getting to be kind of a chore. And wouldn't it be nice if we had something where we could 
you know, interact with other computers wirelessly. And so they were actually already on this about the same time that O'Sullivan was on this. O'Sullivan says that he got to it first because he'd already solved the problem. And I'm you know, inclined to believe him, but if you get into sort of a philosophy of science argument, this is something that would have happened anyway. It actually, it, it didn't require somebody going out to look for exploding black holes. We may have gotten an extra year or two off that, but the, the engineers and communications were right on that one. So that one you could go like, well, you didn't really need to be looking for exploding black holes and you still haven't found them. I swear every time on the astronomer's Facebook feed, somebody says, hey, some cool, mysterious new like uh, radio burst. I'm like, exploding black holes, that's what it's going to be. Because one of these days it would be really awesome to have that one. Um, but really, it's just kind of neat. All right. Here's another one that I picked. Something called the Opacity Project. Is anybody in here familiar with that one? Project? Yeah, it's an international collaboration. It's got dozens of people working on it. It was formed about 30 years ago. And this is, this is from their website. To calculate the extensive atomic data required to estimate stellar envelope opacities and to commute through this, right? Most people look at that and they're like, glaze. Here's a number of people that are associated with the Opacity Project. And they're all happy in the sunshine. Not here. Not today. Okay. Now, one of the things that comes across quite often when you read about astronomers or using incredible computer simulations to do blah, if, you, if you're like me and you have this horrible habit of reading the comments underneath them, you say, wow, that's a whole lot of really smart people. We should force them which I always think is kind of interesting. We should force them to work on something more practical. You know, this just seems like a huge waste of brain power. We should make them work on something like, I don't know, cancer research or something. Uh, but there were a couple of names in that list that were italicized. Okay, now, I'm gonna back up a little bit, give you a little bit of background. Uh, again, this, this talk is created for people, just general public. So most of you already know this, but you know, here's the basic, breakdown of the stuff that the sun is made of. And it's all a lot of hydrogen, a little bit of helium, and then there's carbon. And then if you expand the other into its own pie chart, then you wind up with a whole lot of oxygen and some carbon, and then it just kind of, you get down into, you know, some, some of the more obscure elements where you're looking at, you know, one part in a quadrillion um, in the universe. And, and this is the, the composition of the sun, basically. But, Having played with stellar abundances, I now know why it is that we use the logarithmic scale to report them. It's because it doesn't look as bad. Right, You're like, well, the Fe to H of this is 1.7, plus or minus 0.3. What you're really saying is I got this down to a factor of two <laughs> of the right answer. But it doesn't look nearly as bad when you report it in a logarithmic scale, and I never realized how uncertain some of these things really are until I started working with them. And well, if you're going to use the solar standard, are you going to use the meteor, meteor values? Are you going to use the solar photospheric values? Are you going to use these values? Are you going to use these values? And like, oh my gosh, do we really not know the sun that well? And the answer is no, we don't really know it as well as, as we like to pretend we do. You know, you go to the intro astronomy classes and you just tell them, the sun's 90% hydrogen, 9.9% helium, or 9% helium, and 1% other. And then you're done. And all the students go, yay, I know exactly what the sun's made of. But we don't. Um, and thank you, Cecilia Payne, for figuring out the, you know, the big pie slice, because up until 1923, that was kind of a mystery. You know, we were just totally backwards on the way that the composition of the sun and the stars really were. But uh, understanding what exactly, I mean, in, in very specific ratios, what the sun and the stars are made of, of, astrophysically, this is a bad problem to have if you don't know what your own star is made of. And one of the, the members of the Opacity Project Anil Pradhan says, the practical necessity of solving this problem can hardly be overstated. The sun is the standard. It's the standard that's the key to understanding much of astrophysics. And you think, wow, that's special to astronomers. You say the practical necessity of this can hardly be overstated. 
the, the number of proposals I've read that say some of those are, can hardly be overstated. Using the phrase can hardly be overstated is overstated. Okay, it's it, it's really overdone. But really, it's embarrassing. You know, it's like it's right there. Can we not just, can we seriously not figure this one out as well? All right, but what it boils down to is an issue of opacity, and I should probably turn this over to a graduate student or something to describe what opacity is. The last talk I gave, I had like you know eight, ten-year-olds in there, and I'm trying to figure out how do you describe opacity to them. But you guys probably kind of you, you grasp it, you know. The light's trying to get out. The stuff's saying no, right? And and the, then the stuff is very picky about the light that it says no to, and. When you use sort of you know global opacities, you're ignoring just how specific elements are about what they what they say no to. Um, and the thing is that this interaction is what drives your entire temperature and pressure structure in your star. <coughs> like, practically everything that we know about these things is hinging on how well we understand this stuff trying to get out and this stuff saying no. That, that's my not quite graduate level lecture on that. Okay. And so you got you got a mess. It's it's a really, really, really seriously messy situation. Your your densities, your temperatures, they they change enormously from the center on out. And if you really want to try to understand <coughs> how everything is interacting, and then you have to compute how everything is interacting. By the way, here's a, here's a question. How long does it take the energy from the fusion to get to the outside of the sun? A few thousand years. hundred thousand years. About six months. I believe you. You said, you said uh, 10 to 5? Yeah, that's that's mostly what I, I saw things you know in the general neighborhood seventy thousand to uh, upwards of a million, okay, upwards of a million, and that was kind of rare. But it's again we don't even really kind of have much of a grip on that one. But I do know this: if you watch Neil deGrasse Tyson's Cosmos, he said ten million years, and I'm like, no, <laughs> I don't, I can't find anything that's anything within the past 40 years that, that says a number that big. But yeah, my, my students are endlessly florid that you know when you, when you are outside on a sunny day, that energy was actually produced <coughs> sometime in the Pleistocene era. Uh, but you got neutrinos that are whipping through you right now. And they're like, oh my gosh, really? <laughs> That's disgusting. <laughs> Do they hurt? Not usually. Ah! <laughs> All right. So what we need, what the opacity project needed, okay, that they realized back in the early 80s, was what we need is some serious computers that we could feed a whole lot of atomic in, uh, physics into um, so that we could understand how all the atoms and all the free electrons are act interacting with all the different wavelengths of light at every single layer in the sun. No problem. Yeah, that's it. And so you get the opacity project um, that has had some really, really superlative people working on it. But basically, you just feed a whole lot of that into a whole lot of those, and then you just kind of see what gets spit out. That's the short version of it. Now, for people that are wondering, why would you spend not just 30 years, because this is something that's ongoing. It's not like they got an answer. This is even an offshoot of this is just the iron project. Its entire purpose in life is to figure out one element. Okay, just iron. Um, and so a number of people, wow, why, why would you do that? Well, how does this help us? You know, yeah, you're getting paid. You and your dozens of, of team members are getting paid to do this. But seriously, why are we bothering? And one of the things that people seem to forget is that they're, they're made of the same stuff that the rest of the universe is made of. At least 4% of it. Okay? The, you are made of atoms. Okay? Your atoms interact with light, too. Sometimes you wind up getting atoms in places you don't want atoms. Okay? This is actually a very serious problem. This is not just an astrophysical problem. This is a personal problem. 
This is a personal and, and huge problem. <coughs> okay? I don't know anybody whose life has not been touched in some horrible way by cancer. Okay? I don't know that anybody knows anybody that's not touched by that. But the Opacity Project turns out to have an interesting, not a solution, it's not a cure, but a potentially useful therapy because of what they found out through this. And what they found out resulted in a paper that I imagine <coughs> most people look at the title and go, wow, that's special. Resonant X-ray enhancement of the OJ effect in IZ atoms, molecules, and nanoparticles. But really what it boils down to is they found out that platinum and gold interact very, very, very strongly with very specific X-ray wavelengths. They find this out through working on the Opacity Project. Okay? And uh, the OJ effect is something that I didn't, I had never heard of before I started looking into this, and I feel like I should have probably somewhere along the way. I know when I first saw it, I thought it said auger. And I thought, well, maybe they're misspelling it or something. Mm -hmm. But basically, you, you know, fire a particular wavelength at an atom, and instead of just plucking off one of the outer shell electrons, you pull one from the bottom of your Jenga stack, and then the others do what they do when there's a hole to be filled. So one very specific wavelength interacts to plop this inner electron out, the others cascade down. Well, they're either going to release more energy in, in terms of a photon, or they're going to kick out some electrons. But the removal of one electron results in a cascade of electrons and, and high energy light coming out if you shine the right wavelength of x-ray at them, okay, just the right. So what they figured, and this actually happened after just sort of a, a dinner party between two people that are still associated with the Opacity Project and one guy that used to be associated with the Opacity Project but then uh, branched off and is now doing biophysics sorts of things. He's in, he's medical applications and things. And they were just chatting about results that they had got. Wow, there's this amazing resonance with uh, gold atoms and this particular wavelength. And he, they, they started thinking, what could we do with that? You know, maybe you could take a, a gold nanoparticle and you could embed it in a tumor and you could fire that one particular wavelength that doesn't really bother anybody else, but it sure bothers gold. And you could get a cascade effect that would be sort of like a localized radiation treatment instead of firing lots and lots and lots of different wavelengths of x-rays and just praying that you kill the tumor before you kill the person, which is basically how, how most cancer therapies work, right? We just want to kill it before we kill you. So, that's basically <coughs> the upshot of what they want to do. And I say they want to do, and I wanted to do, because this is something that is still, it's an ongoing thing. It might wind up as being an abysmal failure. They've done some tests. Um, one of the problems is finding monochromatic x-ray source. That's not trivial. There's apparently not a lot of them around. Uh, another problem is that the NIH is saying, well, we don't really want to fund this until you show us that it's going to work, but you can't really show that it's going to work until you get funding, to, you know, and so you're stuck in that funding catch-22. <coughs> but uh, resonant nanoplasma theranostics is something that might, because of the Opacity Project, become something that could ease the agony of cancer treatment. It's also a pretty good imaging tool. It's also a pretty good diagnostic tool. They've come up with a whole suite of things that they could use this type of, of, of knowledge for that would benefit people. And it's not because that's what they set out to do. They set out to solve some problems. They, they want to know point. What's the sound made of? Okay. These are the, the two that I talked to quite extensively. And one of the things that came up in the discussions that I had with the people that, that are featured in this book is that the specialization of these two is so different from anything that 
you know, a cancer researcher would be looking into. They, they, they do have a physics background, but they're not involved with the detailed research of photon-atom interactions. She is. And again, just like when o O'Sullivan was saying it was sort of an ecosystem, um, Anil says that the work exemplifies fundamental science and the underlying symbiosis between apparently disparate branches of science. That's the thing, is that when you make connections, these are things that you never saw before. And uh, that's the uh, <coughs> creativity, is that you're, you're seeing something in a way that isn't the standard way of seeing it. Um, and, and that's something that came up with everything in this book. Uh, there's lots and lots of other <coughs> examples, like for instance, the curvature of space-time, you know, just some mental gymnastics by Einstein way back when, but we've got to build that into your GPS or you're going to be severely out of luck trying to find something with you. I, I've used that so many times it's not even funny. My phone, and I just accept that it's working. You know, don't really think to, well I do because I'm a nerd, but most people don't think about what it is that goes into getting you where you're going. You're like, oh, it's talking to four satellites. Holy crap, there's four things that are orbiting our planet right now that are talking to my phone. Actually, they're not talking to it, but it's picking up their signal. Uh, and, and without having relativity built into your GPS, it ain't gonna work working. Okay, because it, it doesn't take much of an error to get you in the wrong place, because light kind of travels pretty zippy. Um, this is a whole other chapter. I gotta say this is one of my favorite ones. When I was writing it, this is uh, Toto Oliveira. He's from the Philippines, grew up in the Philippines, thought that cone snails were just really cool back when he was a kid. Uh, hey, cone snails, they're just cool. He collected shells, wanted to find out a little about them. Uh, goes through his undergraduate work, graduate work, comes over to the United States, he's here. Uh, he felt, you know, he, he really felt sort of a need to get back to his, his home country and contribute there. So he goes back, but there's no funding for anything. And he has no lab. He's been working in DNA research, but he can't create a, a competitive DNA lab in the Philippines with no money. And so what he decided to do was just go back to a question that he had when he was a kid, and that is, why do cone snails kill people? You know, what is it about them? And this is not something that is like a huge problem. There's like a dozen cone snail deaths recorded in the past 200 years. Okay. More people die from cows each year. Like 20 a year, you get a cow falling over on somebody. <laughs> Cone snails, they're not really at the top of your, your mortality list. Um, so he, he put together this thing that looked like seventh grade shop project. You know, some hardware cloth, and then he got some mice and started to do some things that involved injecting mice and hanging them on this little screen and, and injecting the mice with, with various components of the cone snail venom. Um, and then he found out rather quickly and rather anticlimactically that cone snail venom is basically a combination of uh, pufferfish venom um, and cobra venom. I mean, it's the same basic components. It does the same sort of thing. And that's why you die. And so he's like, well, bummer, I'm done. But one of his students, one of his undergraduate students said, hey, what if we take some of these components and instead of injecting them directly into the spine, we direct, we, we inject them in, you know, subcutaneously to see what happens. And he goes, why would we do that? And the undergraduate's like, I don't know, because it seems like a fun thing to do. And, and so what they find out is by, one, listening to the student instead of saying, no, that's not an idea worth pursuing, would say, okay, well, you know, let's do this. If that's something that you're willing to do, then you know, we can we can set this project up. We shouldn't not doing DNA anymore. Might as well do something with these mice. We've got bucket loads of them. Uh, so they they started to inject the different components differently and found out there were all kinds of interesting neurological things that went down with these mice. One of those things that they found was that. The signal from the body to the brain of, of pain is halted with one of these things. Now, 
if you're trying to paralyze and eat your prey, this is one of the useful things about, about being a cone snail, is that you harpoon, this is absolutely mind-boggling to me to find out that there's snails in the sea that have these harpoons, and here comes a fish, and you know, they get them, and they get videos of Nemo struggling for a brief second, and like, plop, and then being totally paralyzed, and then this snail just goes, you know, I go, oh my gosh, that's disgusting. Nemo. My little boy walks in just as I'm watching this, and he's like, hey, that looks like Nemo. No, honey, don't look. But, you know, to, it's a, it's a useful thing if you're trying to catch and paralyze your prey, but it turns out to be an incredibly awesome thing if you have massive chronic pain. Okay, and there's some, there's some chronic pain that doesn't respond to anything else that anybody has ever done. Uh, you get accustomed to morphine, um, and there's some other things that, that just don't work for certain people, but one of these components of cone snail toxin can be, and, and this is, you've got to be in some serious pain to get to this level, but you hook up a, a thing to your spinal column, okay, and it, it actually enters your spinal fluid, it's not, you don't just take a pill. And what it basically does is it tells your body, or actually, yeah, it tells your body to stop sending pain signals to your brain. Your brain doesn't, you could, you could stick your hand in a vat of boiling oil and you would not feel it, okay? And type of pain that you get from cancer, for instance, okay? Um, the, the one person that, that I found that had the most insane <coughs> pain was this, this Something that has the nickname of the suicide disease because it's 24-7. Everything hurts. Awful. <laughs> and this is the one thing that has allowed that person to get a normal life again instead of feeling like they just wanted to die. And that's this guy's curiosity about cone snails, but not just his curiosity about cone snails. The fact that he was in an institution, you know, a university-type setting, where asking questions was the norm. This is what you do. You encourage your students to ask questions, and sometimes they ask questions as you go like, okay, well, go see, you know, go find out. And, and maybe to, you know, the learned professor, you think that this is a waste of time, but this is the way we learn new things, and this is, this is now a real drug. It's called Prealt. It's called Prealt because they said calling it conotoxin Sounded like a bad marketing choice, right? You don't want to sell a toxin to people. You don't want to hear that. Um, and then there's the story of the, the hardy little microbes in Yellowstone. You know, if you walk through Yellowstone, there's this weird pink slimish stuff that nobody really bothered to do much studying on until the 50s and 60s. And there was a, a scientist who, he and his wife were just sort of like ADD science types. They would take around experimental equipment with them wherever they went. And she finally had persuaded him to go to Yellowstone, and he didn't really want to go to Yellowstone, because he kind of thought of it as being a little too touristy, uh, and he was more, more out in real nature, not Yellowstone nature. Uh, but then they thought, oh, well, that's weird. Those are, those are things that are growing in almost boiling water. Okay, that ain't right. And all of the work for you know, the, the thermophiles that have been done up to that point, all these, these organisms that can withstand pretty high temperatures, they had stopped raising the temperatures in the lab because they figured there was no point in going to any higher temperature. But these guys are having a party in that. Uh, and so they tried to culture and failed to culture these things in the lab, but there was something else that they hadn't noticed that they cultured quite nicely in the lab. And that's Thermos aquaticus, which if you go to particular storehouse of um, biological things, uh, um, you can order it. But you have to sign something that says, I promise that I'm only using this for research, and if there's anything that could potentially be commercially valuable, I will give this back to the United States Parks Department. Because the United States Parks Department is saying, you know, really kind of tired of the fact that people come through and they find things like some weird creepy crawly thing that is fine at almost boiling temperatures, and then they realize that they can use that in a process like polymerase chain reaction, which is where you have a DNA sample, and you want to try to make more of it, 
And so basically, you, and Sam Houston State actually has quite a nice little forensics lab uh, of all places. And you have this, this PCA machine, or PCR, or PCA, and it's a, it, it looks like a bread maker. Right? And you pop it open and you put things in that UPS has delivered. And then you close it and you turn it on and it does this thermal cycling where it rips the DNA apart and then it cools down and since you've put in all of these extra nucleotides, they, it, it you know, brings together two DNA strands. And then you rip the DNA apart and now you've got four DNA strands <coughs> when you cool it back down. And then you heat it up and that rips the DNA apart but you've got to have an enzyme in there that can actually withstand the temperature extremes that you're taking it to. Well, you get that enzyme from the stuff that was in Yellowstone. That somebody just kind of went, oh, hey, that's weird. Let's culture that. Okay. And there's a, a, an entire uh, project called the Innocence Project that is digging back through all of this old evidence that's been sitting around for decades. And they've gotten at least 300 people uh, Exonerating. I mean, they were they were wrongly convicted based on the, the evidence, and so they're they're going back through. And DNA evidence is helping to release a, a whole lot of people, and it's because the curiosity of somebody that's going through Yellowstone, because the people that were working in the labs weren't taking it to that extreme, and you wouldn't be able to do this nearly as efficiently. This is a sophomore level lab. You throw a DNA sample in something and you pour in a bunch of other things and you hit go. You hang out for an hour and a half. And then you read the result. It's insane. Okay. This is particularly uh, appropriate for a and but John O'Sullivan is saying, you know, when we do comprehend dark energy and dark matter, the resulting paradigm shift might quite possibly turn more than our understanding of the universe on its head. When you're when you're probing what the universe is doing, you know, when you're finding the electron and you're understanding its properties, that's a fundamental thing about you know matter right there. And so if you've got the entire electronics industry, you can't begin to imagine what will happen when we figure out 96% of the universe, right? <laughs> you know, electrons, they're not that much. Really, it's like a piece of fluff compared to everything else. And so, when people say, "Well, why are you wasting your time trying to understand dark energy? Why are you wasting your time trying to understand dark matter? What good is that going to be?" This, this is something fundamental to the universe that you're living in. When we figure this out, it's going to be, it's going to be life changing, most likely. Okay. But really, the upshot of the, the entire book is you just don't ever know where your curiosity is going to take you. Sometimes it'll take you to life-changing places. Sometimes it won't, but sometimes it will, and that's what. Anybody have any questions? Questions? Uh, so right uh, at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned the shuttle, and uh, I had much the same thing. I actually made it to the very last one. Oh, thank you. I mean, yeah. well, that's cool. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, this comes up fairly often. I'm not uh, in astronomy, but I, I try to keep my thumb on that pulse. And I was explaining one day to a neighbor who came to a space telescope, and I particularly just enjoyed the, like, the notion of putting a thing in a little round. That always was cool to me. And I was going on and on, and she, and she stopped me, interrupted, and she said, why would we ever do something? What good and is it? as a scientist, my knee-jerk reaction was just because that's awesome. My knee-jerk um, reaction is to actually jerk my knee. And right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and so the shuttle program, and where I'm going with this, the shuttle program um, had a fiscal multiplier above two. So for every dollar put in, you get uh, at least two out. Um, and I, I don't know exactly what it was. I think the interstate has something less than two. And so nobody would ever question the interstate's you know importance to, to the economy. Um, and so when we're kind of confronted with those questions, like, yeah, we can, we can wax philosophic. Um, is there anything we can do as a facet of our public outreach as scientists to, I, I to, think, to make that argument on, on ground, meet them on their own ground? <coughs> I think when you, when you say 
when you give the story behind things that they use all the time. Yeah. You know, like the GPS. That one, for whatever reason, despite the fact that you know every scientist that I know is fully aware of that, it takes people by total surprise when you say, well, you know, that GPS, you you gotta you gotta incorporate relativity in there. Or it's just not gonna work. And they go, no. Because when I get to that, that particular chapter in my classes, you know, the sort of relativistic stuff, people go like, oh my gosh, why does it matter? Why can't we? Think, well, here's, here's why it matters. Um, and so I think, you know, the more concrete examples you can give, the better. But having said that, I mean, the, you're going to get counter arguments. Well, can't we get the same result by just having a plot? By just funneling more money into applied science with that same, thing. <coughs> yeah. you know, I don't know what I don't know how you could have achieved GPS empirically. I imagine it could be done, but it, I think it would have been a pain in the butt, you know. And so, you know, sort of philosophically, they 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 can always counter. Well, we could take the however many billions of dollars and just funnel it straight into applied. And so, I mean, you. Just going to wind up going around and around. But I think the more concrete examples you can give of stuff that we weren't expecting to have happen, and one of the good places to go, I mentioned the Golden Fleece Awards. Well, these days there's this thing called the Golden Goose. It's kind of like the antithesis of the Golden Geese. And uh, they award every year something that has had an unexpected payoff, um, like uh, understanding the glowing jellyfish. And that's a total curiosity thing. Don't call in jellyfish. That's really freaking cool. You know, but then you can use that that understanding of why they glow to, to use to develop some uh, genetic tracers. And so if you go to the Golden Goose Awards, uh, just Google that and it'll get you right to it. And it's got this huge list of things that were the surprising game changers that, that, that came from places that you go, that's random. Right? That, that's my advice, but I don't know. He actually probably is a better person to talk to about about, about the public. Lamar Smith is actually a strong supporter of science, and um, he's also a politician. So he's combining two things. He's on the science committee, but he's also trying to maintain his political base. And sometimes we feed into that because we do give stupid titles to our proposals, or in astronomy, we put this as my own give really stupid acronyms to the things that we're doing, and we seem to be proud of it. And there's a difference between being excited about the research and really curiosity-driven, and then, but at some time, falling over into silliness. And the silliness can come back and haunt us. Yeah, I saw a, an acronym recently that was SWAP. It's a survey of water and ammonia in the galaxy. But they, this it, tried really hard to come up with a sort of an ironic acronym or something. But yeah, swag. Oh, but, swag. But it seems like some of the part of the science these days when you hear a talk is the person will spend a couple of minutes describing how they came up with the acronym. Is it that anything to do with the science? And there's nothing wrong with a good acronym, but, but scientists also need to, to express the curiosity and talk about the ecosystem, but not fall over into this. Look how clever I am. How clever I am. It, 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 it's off-putting to people, and we don't realize it. We think it's cool, but to many people it isn't. Well, in this room, we all think that you know, swag is a great acronym, pack and we wish we'd come up with it. But yeah, when you look at the, at the paper. I'll follow up on that. The idea that the supply, but just one thing I took away, I think you mentioned it, is that the number of startup companies that that's not pure research at all. Every applied research has failed, right? I mean, is, is you know crazy. the number? Yeah. I mean, I know it's I knew it's a high number. I just don't know off my head what a fraction of those to actually fail. And I, I, I have not actually memorized my own book, even though I wrote it. But there's a a, a whole section that describes you know, the average age of a company you know, or the average yeah, lifespan right. of a company right. and the average lifespan of a really really epically successful company is maybe 40 years okay. so even if you had a company that you know had a had a really 
free research program, you know, you say, hey guys, do whatever, like fries. Electronics actually has a, its own mathematical research mm -hmm. branch. And they just say, you guys go do math stuff. Um, but even if you had something, you know, you're at Wonder Bread or something, and you say, okay, we're going to have this R&D, and you guys can do whatever it is that you want to go out and, and play with, you still, in a normal company, are never going to get from the, wow, that's a neat jellyfish glowing, to here's something that you can do with it. And that's the thing about a, a society, is that the government is in the business of trying, is under the illusion that the society is going to go on in perpetuity, right? And, and so what they want to do, what the ideal is super duper long term goals, which is why you know, having the National Science Foundation is great because it, it's, it just keeps happening. But if you do leave it in the hands of startup companies, you leave it in the hands of, of you know, applied things, then a lot of times you're gonna peter out before you will ever made the application of the thing that you found out. And, and so that's the, the really nice thing about science is not only it, that you've got a you know, rather constant funding base, but it's international. And you, you collaborate with people all over the planet. And so what's happening over here is impacting, but that doesn't happen with most business models. Well, it's, it's starting to. It's always been the norm for science. Okay, well, thank you, Speaker, again.